In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of quantum numbers and atomic orbitals that we started in the last video. So this is uh, basically the same slide that we saw at the end of the last video. And so we said that the solutions to the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom uh, are called orbitals. And these orbitals have unique energies, and they're characterized uh, by a series of three quantum numbers. And so we can sort of think of the quantum numbers as being like an address. They tell us the shape of the region in space around the nucleus that the electron uh, is likely to occupy. And they also tell us what the energy of the orbitals is going to be. And in my address analogy, n, the principal quantum number, is kind of like the state that the electron is living in. Uh, L, the angular quantum number, uh, is kind of like the city. And n sub L, the magnetic quantum number, is kind of like the street that the electron is living on. And so, more formally, the principal quantum number, also called the shell, tells us the size and energy of the orbital. So, the bigger, the larger the value of n, uh, the larger the orbital is and the higher in energy it is. And n uh, has to be a positive integer, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. L, the angular quantum number, uh, is also called the subshell. It tells us the shape of the orbital, and the energy also depends on L, but not as much as n. Um, now, the value of L depends on n. So once we specify n, that determines what the possible values of L are. So I'll use a different example than I did last time. Let's say that n is equal to 4. Right? Well, the possible values of L is it's got to be an integer between 0 and n minus 1. So n minus 1 is 3, so that means L can be anything between 0 and 3. And finally, m sub L, the magnetic quantum number, uh, we talked before that that tells us about the orientation of the orbital in space. And I, I gave an example in the last video, and I'll give another one uh, later on in this video. Uh, but the values of m sub L depend on the value of L. So, for example, if I told you that the value of n was equal to 4, and then I said for this electron L is equal to 1, then the possible values of m sub L would be anything from minus L to positive L, all the integers uh, positive and negative in between. So in this case, M sub L could be negative 1, 0, or 1. All right, so I mentioned that the, uh, the angular uh, momentum quantum number, L, tells us about the shape of the orbitals. And so there are uh, just a couple shapes uh, that, that are possible for the orbitals that are most commonly occupied in an atom. So when L is equal to zero, that's what we call an S orbital. And S orbitals, uh, it looks like a circle here, but they're spherical, they're like a basketball. When L is equal to one, uh, those are called P orbitals, and they look sort of like a dumbbell. And so, again, this is three dimensions. So you can kind of imagine like if we had two balloons tied together in the middle, and the balloons were directly uh, apart from each other, that's what a P orbital looks like. When L is equal to 2, that's called a d orbital. And so you can see a d orbital is kind of like two p orbitals uh, put perpendicular to one another. Uh, and the d orbitals, uh, while they are three dimensional, you know, it's kind of like having four balloons, uh, the four lobes all lie in a plane. And then when L is equal to 3, that's what we call an f orbital. And you can see as the angular momentum quantum number increases, the the complexity of the shape of the orbitals also increases. And so in this case, for uh, L orbitals, we typically have eight lobes. And uh, the, uh, the value of L can go higher, but uh, for most uh, atoms, or at least or all atoms, when they're in their ground state, um, all of their electrons will occupy one of these types of orbitals. And so what I've shown here is what we call an orbital energy diagram. So this is the, the list of the orbitals uh, in an atom, uh, at least up through n is equal to 3. And so let's see how these uh, energy levels are related to the quantum numbers. So the first value for n is 1. And so this group of orbitals down here, right, which is really just one orbital, that is 
the n is equal to one shell. And we said that when we specify n, uh, that determines the possible values of L. And L can be anything between zero and n minus one. And so in the case of n is equal to one, n minus one is zero. So L can be anything between zero and zero. So when n is equal to one, the only possible value of L is zero. And then similarly, the values of M sub L depend on the values of L. And if L is zero, M sub L can be, you know, plus or minus L. So the only possible value of M sub L is zero. So there's only one possible address in the n is equal to one shell. There's only one city and there's only one street for the electron to live on, meaning there's only one orbital in the n is equal to one shell. And because L is equal to zero, that's an s orbital. And so we call this orbital the 1s orbital. And in any atom, that is the lowest energy orbital. When we go up to n is equal to 2, right now we're in the n is equal to 2 shell. Right, and so kind of going with my address analogy, when n is equal to 2, there are now two possible cities. So now L, because n minus 1 is 1, L can be anything between 0 and 1, and so I have two possible values of L. And so I have two what we call subshells. Right, I have the 2s subshell and the 2p subshell. So if we first consider the subshell where L is equal to 0, and n is equal to 2. So we're in the 2, you know, state, if you will. We're in the L is equal to 0 city. The values of m sub L are still just 0, uh, because if L is 0, m sub L can only be 0. So in the 2s subshell, there's still just one orbital, and it's the 2s orbital. So the quantum numbers for this 2s orbital are n is equal to 2, L is equal to 0, and M sub L is equal to 0. But now when I consider the subshell where L is equal to 1, so when L is equal to 1, those are our p orbitals, so this is the 2p subshell. So when L is equal to 1, now M sub L can be minus 1, 0, or positive 1. And so because there are three possible values of M sub L, that means there are three 2p orbitals, as we can see here in our orbital energy diagram. There are three 2p's, right? So one of those orbitals, its complete address, or its complete list of quantum numbers, is n is equal to 2, l is equal to 1, and then we don't know which one is which, but one of them is going to be m sub l is negative 1. Another one of the orbitals will be n is equal to 2, l is equal to 1, and m sub l is equal to 0. And then the third one, its address is n is equal to 2, l is equal to 1, and then m sub l is equal to plus 1. All right, let me erase some of this. Give us some more room to work here. All right, so then when we go to, let's use a different color, so when we go to the n is equal to 3 shell, now the possible values of L, the subshells are 0, 1, and 2. And so I again get 1 s orbital, I get 3 p orbitals, and now when L is equal to 2, I get d orbitals. And when L is equal to 2, that means m sub L can be minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, or 2, so now there are five d orbitals in the d subshell. If we were to go on to n is equal to 4, all right, so let's say n is equal to 4, now l can be 0, 1, 2, or 3. And so when n is equal to 4, I have s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, and now when L is equal to 3, I have F orbitals. And when L is equal to 3, the possible values of M sub L are minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And 
so in, an, in any F subshell, I would have seven orbitals. And the S, P, D, and F orbitals are, in any ground state electron configuration, those are the orbitals that would be occupied. We can go on to G and H uh, in higher orbitals, um, but those would only be occupied in cases where um, we, we've had an atom, say, absorb a photon and become excited, and then have an electron briefly promoted up into one of those higher energy orbitals. Now, we see something interesting when we look at the periodic table, and we'll get into this more when we talk about electron configurations, uh, but just as sort of a preview to that, when uh, we talk about the periodic table, we talk about these elements as being in the S block. And as we see, they're going to be filling the uh, the S electrons when we do electron configurations. And I can put two electrons in any one of those orbitals that we saw on the, the last slide in the energy diagram. And so for any value of N, there is one S orbital and I can put two electrons in it. And if you notice, there are two columns in the S block. We sometimes say that the elements over here are in the p block. And we know that there are three p orbitals in any p subshell. If I can put two electrons in uh, any orbital, that means if I have three p orbitals, I could put six electrons in those. And if you notice, there are one, two, three, four, five, six columns in the p block. All right, you probably see where this is going. The transition metals, we say that they're in the d block. And I can have five d orbitals, and if I can put two electrons in each one, I could have 10 d electrons, and the transition metals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then the way we draw the lanthanides and actinides down here, um, we actually have 15 uh, because we sort of left the space here, but uh, if we put lanthanum and actinium uh, here in the periodic table, right, we have seven uh, F orbitals in an F block, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, corresponding to the 14 electrons that I could put in the seven F orbitals. And so I have to imagine when uh, people were first solving the Schrodinger equation for atoms, and they saw how this matched the periodic table, uh, it must have been mind blowing uh, because, you know, starting, you know, purely through mathematics and treating the electrons as if they existed as waves. And then we see these solutions that uh, have this uh, match in how the periodic table was organized. Um, that must have been pretty exciting. So just to look a little bit more at the shapes of these orbitals. And so here I'm showing uh, the shapes of S orbitals. And so what we have here is the list of the, the quantum numbers, the n, the l, and the m sub l quantum numbers. When n is equal to 1, uh, and we have l is equal to 0 and m sub l is equal to 0, that's our 1s orbital. You can see when I go to n is equal to 2, the s orbital is still spherical, but they get larger, like we said they did. And we saw in the previous slides that they were higher in energy. So when n gets larger, the size of the orbitals increases. Uh, what these pictures are showing, uh, you don't have to worry as much about, but this is uh, sort of an advanced topic. Um, we get what are called nodes in our orbitals. These are regions of space where the electrons can't be. So, for example, in this 3s orbital, the electron could be in this outer ring. It can't be in this white region, but then it could be in this middle ring. It can't be in this white region, but it can be in uh, the very center. And so these regions where we can't find the electrons uh, are called nodes. And generally, as the orbitals increase in energy, we get more nodes in our orbitals. I'm not going to ask you specifically about nodes, uh, but you should know that as the value of the principal quantum number increases, the size of the orbitals increases. All right, we know that uh, when L is equal to 1, that's our P subshell. And when L is equal to 1, M sub L can be minus 1, 0, or 1. And these tell us about the different directions that the orbitals lie in. And there's not a 1 to 1 
correlation between minus 1, 0, and 1, and what we call the px, the py, and the pz orbitals, um, but I have three uh, values of m sub l, and there are three directions that the p orbital can be oriented. And so the three orbitals in a p subshell are all identical in shape and energy, but they're pointed in different directions. All right, here we have pictures of the d orbitals. Um, and so when n is equal to 3, that's the first time l can be equal to 2. And so these are our three d orbitals, right? The values of m sub l are minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and positive 2. And so almost all of the d orbitals have the same shapes, um, but they're in uh, different directions. The one exception is one of them is a little bit weird, uh, the dz squared orbital. It kind of looks like a p orbital with a donut around it. Um, so that's just sort of a weird shape that the fifth uh, d orbital um, takes on. And finally, here we have uh, pictures of the seven uh, f orbitals. And a lot of them share this common shape, but then we also have several that kind of look like the dz squared orbital in the, uh, in the d orbitals. Uh, now, as far as knowing the shapes, um, I might ask you to draw a, a rough, roughly what an s, a p, and a d orbital looks like. Um, I won't ask you to draw the s, right? But if I ask you to draw an s orbital, right, you don't have to get fancy, right? You can just draw, I know, we know that it's three-dimensional, but if I ask you to draw, you can just draw a sphere for an s orbital. For a p orbital, uh, we sort of want the dumbbell. And then you should know that most d orbitals kind of look like double p orbitals. Uh, but I think it is also good to be aware that uh, one of the d orbitals is this dz squared, uh, this kind of like a p orbital with, uh, with a donut around it. And so sometimes uh, I get questions from students and they say, well, if um, the Bohr model is wrong, if that's not what atoms look like, what does an atom look like? So this is kind of the one of the better pictures uh, that I've been able to find. If, if we kind of wanted to understand what uh, an atom looks like, what we have is the overlapping orbitals. So in this picture, we've kind of got the 1s orbital here in the middle, and then the 2s orbital, then we have the two p orbitals all overlapping, and then larger than that is the three s orbital. So, you know, this is a, a pretty good representation of kind of what uh, an atom might look like, because the electrons are moving so fast, we wouldn't actually be able to see the individual electrons. Um, now, of course, atoms are so small that they don't interact with light the same way that, um, you know, macroscopic objects do. So, um, I don't know that it would be possible to see them at all, but this is probably, um, as good a representation as any. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out, uh, I've looked online to see if I could find uh, simulations or videos that, that maybe had a good picture of what uh, an atom might look like. And this is a uh, documentary that I saw on the BBC. Um, if you go to roughly the 13 minute, 10 second mark, um, I, I like uh, the way they sort of, uh, display or the graphics they use to show what an atom might look like. So that's something else that you could check out.